Welcome everybody to the first installment of 2022 of the History Speaker Series. We are thrilled that you all uh, came out to join us this evening virtually. Um, thank you to all of you for attending and to those of you who donated as well. Thank you so much for uh, supporting us and for being a part of uh, our program tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce the folks who are on the screen right now, although I'm gonna save one for a moment. Um, I have Monica, who is uh, the operations coordinator at the Aurelia Museum. She's running the Zoom this evening. We have Trish, who is the head of the history committee at OMA. Um, and then I'm Lindsay, I'm the history coordinator at the Aurelia Museum of Art and History. Um, and then the last person, of course, is our presenter for this evening, uh, who we've brought back by popular demand. Uh, we have, of course, Dave Town. Uh, Dave is a local athlete, chiropractor, historian, author. Um, Dave's written a number of books on local history topics, including Walter Knox, the YMCA, uh, recently, The Spanish Flu, and uh, many more books besides that. Tonight, Dave is bringing us a challenging topic that is so incredibly important to the history of Aurelia and the history of Canada on a grander scale as well. Um, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dave Town for this evening. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're able to come tonight. It's a lot better doing this online than having to go out in the weather tonight. So I guess there is a little upside to this whole COVID lockdown thing. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about the great meeting of the chiefs of 1846 that happened in Aurelia. Um, it's really the story of Chief William Yellowhead. And if anyone has lived in Aurelia for very, very long, you recognize the name Yellowhead, but few people know very much about him. And when I started looking into this topic, I was really curious because there's so little documented about who he was and, and uh, why he's so renowned. Um, so tonight we're, we're gonna be looking at a Yellowhead and his cohort, Chief Ashante from uh, Coldwater, but it's all in the context of the great meeting of 1846. So we have to get into a little bit, a little bit of background um, to understand the parameters of this meeting. So it all starts in, in the 1690s when the Ojibwe came down from the north and took possession of all of southern Ontario, pushing the Mohawks out. Um, soon after that, they, they started a, a trading relationship with the French. The French were pushed out by the British in 1759. For anyone who went to public school in, in Canada knows that. And uh, in 1783, the British began purchasing tracts of land from uh, the Ojibwe and the other tribes in that area. This is a map that shows uh, the progression of their acquisitions. And you'll see they started up towards Montreal and they spread down across Lake Ontario, across Lake Erie. And once they had all of those plots of land, they started acquiring the, the inlands from, uh, from the natives. And you'll see on the sidebar there that before the War of 1812, um, they just paid cash for those plots of land, a minuscule amount of cash, but at least they paid money up front for them. But after the war, they stopped giving the, the, uh, the natives money for their land and they started paying yearly annuities. So small payments every year in perpetuity. Um, the reason being, they didn't think the natives were sophisticated enough to handle the money. And we'll get into more of that in a, in a moment. But you can see the tracks of land went off uh, gradually over the years. And the big question is, why would the natives sell their land? If you know, they possessed it all, they were making uh, good commerce from the fur trade and, and everything else. Why would they sell their land? And there's a number of reasons for it. The two big reasons are uh, pestilences that were brought by the Europeans when they came to Canada. The first one um, was alcohol. Uh, the traders found quite quickly that if they plied the natives with alcohol before a trading session, they could, they could squeeze a better deal out of them. And it didn't take long until there was hopeless addiction on a lot of the uh, 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 tribal homelands. And uh, eventually, alcohol became the point of the trade. They were, they were trading their furs for alcohol. Um, and we all know what alcohol does to a society, and it, and it ravaged um, the whole native culture. 
The second pestilence that came was the European diseases that the natives had no natural immunity for. So this was smallpox and whooping cough and the measles. Some of these outbreaks could have as high as a 50% mortality, mortality rate, like an incredibly high uh, cause of death for the natives and it devastated their, their society. And so you, you have this, this people who are having a, a a drastic change in, in their way of life and their, their numbers reducing. Um, between 1750 and 1814, their numbers reduced about 75%. I mean, they were devastated as a culture. Um, and those that were left um, were in, in a state of despondency um, because of the alcoholism and, and all the ravages that brought. So why would the natives sell their land? Well, because they didn't have much of a choice. And also, they had an avid seller. The British, unlike the French, um, wanted to colonize. The French were happy to stay in Montreal and Quebec and have the natives come to them and trade their furs and, and they carried on that way for a long time. But the British wanted to bring in settlers. And starting after the American Revolution when the United Empire Loyalists started coming to Canada, um, there is this mass influx of, of uh, British people looking for their own piece of land. And so the government had to secure that land. And so they bought it from the natives and the natives in their despondency really had no choice because they were going to get overwhelmed or they could, or they could come to this arrangement. So that's why the land started getting sold. In 1812, the, the British and the, and the United States went to war and the British were hopelessly outnumbered. There were a million people in the United States and they had some three or 4,000 troops in Canada to defend themselves. They desperately needed any allies they could get. And they negotiated with great diplomacy uh, with the Ojibwe and the Mohawks as sovereign nations. And they treated them as sovereign nations. And the, the native peoples were decisive in a number of battles because of the fear they brought. A lot of the American farmers who were in their militia ranks turned and fled when they, when they heard those war whips coming from the other side of the, of the, uh, the front. Um, you know, the, the Battle of Detroit was won because of the, the way the, uh, the Ojibwe and the Chippewa uh, carried out their attack. So that's, a, that's an important point that they were treated as sovereign nations because after the war, there was a, a dramatic change in, uh, in how the, the relationship went. After the War of 1812, there was a rapid um, uh, progression of the, the purchasing of the native land. So by the mid 1820s, almost all of Southern Ontario was in British hands and the natives were relegated to about 20 reservations um, across Southern Ontario. So these are all the stars you see on this map here. So they used to own all of that land and now they are on these, these small uh, um, five and 10,000 acre um, plots of land and that's where they were stuck. And they were on those plots of land with promises, um, the, the, the government of Upper Canada convinced them to sell their land on the promise that they would build them villages, they would build them schools, they would bring in uh, teachers to teach them how to farm and, and, and pick up the, the white ways. They would provide them with ongoing support in farming supplies and, and some monetary grants. And of course, they all had these small annuities that were coming every year. And the natives became quite de dependent on those. But the, the British had a problem in the 1820s. Um, all across their empire, they had displaced indigenous people from their lands in the way they did here. And they started to get a conscience and they felt they had an obligation to do something and provide for these indigenous people. So these were the, the, the Ojibwe in, in, in Upper Canada and the Zulus in South Africa and the Maori in, in New Zealand, the Aboriginals in, in um, Australia. It was, it was now, it was the Indian problem. It was the white man's burden. We have an obligation to support these people. And at this time, they went from being sovereign nations and allies to being wards of the state. And the Indians never agreed to that. They never even understood this was happening. But in, in the government, this became the new attitude. And it changed everything when this happened. So between 1828 and 1844, um, various government entities did studies on how are we going to solve the Indian problem? How are we going to take, take care of these displaced people? How are we going to live in harmony with them? 
Um, there, well, there were two studies done by the British government because the colonial office still called the shots. Um, the governor general of Canada, three different governor generals, each commissioned reports and the, uh, the government of Upper Canada commissioned a report. Um, and there were, a, there were a lot of issues they looked at, but the main, the main issues were, should the uh, Aboriginal peoples be sent into isolation and warded off or they should be assimilated into white society? Could, could the Indians ever become citizens? Could the Indians ever own land? And the schools became very contentious because they were expensive. Every reserve had a school and a school teacher, and this was costing the government money all the time. And this became very contentious. There were continuous conflicts over the reserve lands with the neighboring white settlers, conflicts over hunting on the land, on cutting down trees on the land for forestry, um, even just foraging in, in the woodlands on the native reserves, and even under things like fisheries and um, water rights for mill ponds and things like this. There was continuous conflict um, over how the land that the natives had been promised for their reserves was being used. But overriding all of this was the direction from the colonial office in the, the government in England that the, the Indians were costing too much money. It was too expensive to run the India department. You've got to find ways to cut costs, cut costs, cut costs. And this became through the 1830s and 40s a really critical problem. And it was purely a political problem. So in 1846, after 15 years of study, after six studies, um, the Indian department finally approached the government and said, we have come up with a proposal. We think this policy is gonna solve the problem. It's gonna make everybody happy. And so um, the, the super, supervisor of the Indian department called the chiefs of the Southern Ontario reserves together in Aurelia for a great meeting where he was gonna present this plan and get them to agree to follow what they were proposing. And this is the meeting that happened in Aurelia we're gonna talk about. Now there were two key players at this meeting and they were the two chiefs from the area local to Aurelia. So when, when the Chippewa in this area gave up their reserve, or gave up their lands. This is the reserve they got. They were promised a village in cold water and a village where it really is now, it was called the Narrows back then. They were promised um, their, their portage trail between those two. So a cold water is where you had access to Georgian Bay and one mile on each side of that road. And this was going to be um, their reserve. Chief Yellowhead um, governed a band of about 250 natives at, at the Narrows village and Chief Ashante uh, ruled a likewise 250 member band in Coldwater. Um, there was a third member of this tribe, uh, Chief Snake, and he governed another 200 people who lived on three islands in the south end of, of Lake Simcoe. Um, chief Yellowhead was the principal chief. Um, the other chiefs were subsidiary to him and each reserve had their chief and um, secondary chiefs below them as well. Now Chief Yellowhead, um, had been chief for, for uh, over 30 years. Um, he was 76 years old. He was tired. Um, but he was a great leader. He had been very well respected. And within the Chippewa community across Ontario, he was still respected as, as a leader. He was a non-confrontational non man. He, he believed in diplomacy. He, he always looked for a way to resolve an issue. He was very trusting of the white man. He was very trusting of the white man's laws that, that if they agreed to take this reserve, the white man's laws would protect him and protect their, their, their people. And he was very patient in letting the white men work things out this way. Chief Ashante in Coldwater was a completely different sort. Um, like Yellow Ed, he was a very intelligent man. He, even the, the white governments mentioned in, in places that they, they seemed uh, very intelligent men. But Ashante um, was one to stand up for his rights and he wasn't quite so trusting. And he was not afraid to use force to get what he wanted. He, he wasn't gonna accept um, decisions that didn't seem fair. And, and if he had to, he, was, he would result, uh, resort to force to get what he wanted. Um, so they were, they were two very different people, but both of them, when they went onto this reserve, wholeheartedly accepted the white ways. They both realized with this tidal wave of white settlers coming in, 
Um, they were already uh, dr uh, dramatically outnumbered. It was only going to get worse. Their only chance of survival was to find a way to cohabit with the white man. And they both agreed that taking up the white ways was the way to go. Both of them um, enthusiastically took up Christianity. Um, Ashante gave up on that quite quickly, but uh, Yellowhead uh, was a fervent uh, Christian his, the whole rest of his life. But in the 1830s, a schism began in both of their bands, um, and more so in Yellowhead's band in, in Aurelia. A number of problems arose where he relied on the white man to solve the problem. They didn't get the result they wanted, and the more radical members of his band thought he should have been more forceful, um, and they stopped trusting his judgment because he was, he was too naive when it came to dealing with the white man. And uh, by the late 1830s, after a, after a number of incidents, um, there was a schism where there is the, the, the people who were following Yellowhead and the people who were following um, his secondary chiefs. Um, likewise, in Coldwater, Ashante, he had a small schism in his band. Is after two years, he gave up on the Methodists because um, uh, they were they were not dealing with him as he thought appropriately, and and he came under the sway of the Jesuits in Midland. So he turned to Catholicism, and when he did that. Um, a small handful of his band um, abandoned him and, and went off and settled their own community. Um, two years later, he gave up on Catholicism and gave up on Christianity altogether. Um, but the, the point here is in the 1830s, um, a real schism was developing in Yellowhead's band. It really came to a head in 1844 when Yellowhead gave up on Methodism and, and changed under some considerable pressure. He switched to become an Anglican, expecting his band to follow him and nobody did. And that's when it became very apparent that uh, he was becoming the leader in name only. Um, the, the, his people were following his, his secondary chiefs at that point. And that was just two years before the great meeting. But this is, these are the people um, who were dealing with, the two chiefs were dealing with. They had great reason for disillusionment in, in the white man. Um, I'm just gonna hit a couple of high points here. In the Narrows Village, the the, the Methodist missionaries um, had really helped them um, get rid of alcohol and find sobriety. About half of the band um, um, had found sobriety. But Gerald Alley, the government man, the government agent in Aurelia, um, was given permission to open number one and inn to cater to white travelers who would use that road. They put a stagecoach on that road on the Indian Reserve, which was an affront to them to start with. But then he was allowed to open a tavern there and start serving alcohol right in the heart of the village. And uh, the Methodist missionaries were just flabbergasted that this could be allowed to happen. The, the way uh, land agents uh, continually were selling small parcels of the Indian Reserve to white settlers based on a poorly drawn map, survey map of the of the of the region, and uh, when the Indians complained that that the settlers were encroaching on their land, their complaints never went anywhere. At that point, they started asking for the deeds to their reserve so they could own it, and the government refused to give the deeds, even when ordered by the governor general to do it. The Indian agent still refused to give them their deeds, and they never did get those deeds to the land. It was always the deeds were always held in trust because they were not sophisticated enough to own land. Um, they were continually frustrated that every problem that arose and they appealed to the Indian agent for resolution, there was never a consistent policy. There was always an ad hoc, ad hoc policy. Um, it was always decided case by case and often it was decided in the white man's favor. And there's a number of examples in my book about that. Um, the cold water will, mill is a story unto itself where to get the natives to give up their land and, and become sedentary farmers, it was critical that they have a mill and they were promised that the government would build them a mill. Just when they were about to start construction of the cold water mill, the uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, informed them that no, we've run out of money, you're gonna have to build it yourself out of your own annuity money. So they were, the Indians had to build it by themselves. And then um, there became problems over ownership of that mill. Even though the natives had paid for it and built it themselves, the government was trying to rent it to some, some white settlers. Ashante turned to force where they, they took the mill back by force. They burned down all the outbuildings to show that we will burn it to the grounds rather than let you have it. And for uh, five years, this was a, 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 almost a, a site of warfare going on. It was a very, very stressful time. 
one of the most egregious things that happened it was in 1837 when the uh, Upper Canada uh, Rebellion was going on. If you'll remember your your high school history class, the Rebellion of 1837 with Montgomery's Tavern and all of that. Knowing this was about to happen, the Lieutenant Governor came to the um, the reservation in in Aurelia and he confiscated all the guns that the Indians owned, whether they had bought them or traded for them legally themselves. He said, we need to build up an arm armory to defend the government. We're taking your guns. And from a society that relied on hunting to a great extent to feed themselves, you can imagine what a shock that was. And they never did get them back. Um, it was, it was uh, pretty tragic. And you can understand why they would become disillusioned with the white people. Um, when they finally left, left these two reserves, Shante took his tribe up to Bosley Island in 1842. Uh, Yellowhead took his tribe over across the lake to Rama in 1838-39. Um, the, the arrangement for that was shockingly disadvantageous to them, to the point where in 1842, Yellowhead made an official land claim to the Lieutenant Governor to, uh, to resolve outstanding, an outstanding land claim over this deal. So again, that's another whole story I can go into detail in my book. But there are lots and lots of examples of why Ashanti and Yellowhead were completely disillusioned with uh, their faith in the white man um, by the time the Great Meeting came in 1846, a decade later. So on July 30th and 31st, 1846, the middle of the summer, beautiful warm summer evenings, um, these are all the people who gathered. Um, these are the people who would sit around the council table and could speak. There were another hundred natives in support sitting behind their chief um, so there were about 150 people at this meeting in Aurelia. On the government side, you can see the, the, the chief superintendent and his assistant. He brought very carefully and, and strategically ministers from all the, the religions that the, uh, the natives um, had to do with. And he had two native missionaries sitting with him. These, these were men of great respect and great sway in, in opinion ac across the, the uh, Chippewa of Ontario. And uh, they were sitting there with, with the uh, government men. On the other side, you can see the list of, of uh, chiefs and just a few things to notice in that list. There were three different groups of Indians. Um, there were the Mohawks who, uh, uh, who were from the Bay of Quinty and there were, there were more who would come up from Brantford. But then there were the Mississauga and farther down you see the Chippewa. The Mississauga and the Chippewa are two subgroups of the Ojibwe. Um, and there were there were a number of different groups in the Ojibwe, but in southern Ontario, there were the, the Chippewa and the Mississauga. Uh, the Mississauga had two principal chiefs, we'll see, and Yellowhead was the principal chief of the Chippewa. And the third thing to notice in this list, you can see William Yellowhead's name, the Chippewa of Rama. Right be below him is Chief Nanagishkung, also the Chippewa of Rama. Nanagishkun was specifically invited by the Indian agent to attend because he was in opposition to Yellowhead. Yellowhead had uh, his followers, but Nanagishkun had an equal number, number of followers. And uh, Nanagishkun was there to um, foment the schism that had come up in his band. This was just uh, politicking. Likewise, you see below him is John Assange, who uh, Ashante, who is the Chippewa of Bosley Island, two below him is Thomas Ashante. That's his brother. His brother was that schism band um, who left over the uh, change to Catholicism, and they had created their own small band uh, down at the mouth of the Severn River. Nanagishkung and Yellowhead were at loggerheads. Um, Ashante, the two Ashante brothers agreed on everything except the religion. Um, but uh, they were both there because the Indian agent was trying to foment this schism. So here are the key players. So this is Thomas Anderson and Peter Jones. Peter Jones was a, a Massasauga from the Credit River who, who had a, a, was born to an, an older white father and a teenage uh, Mississauga mother. Um, he was raised, he raised in the native uh, traditional style, but he went on to become um, a Methodist uh, missionary, a Methodist minister. He actually went to London, England twice and met Queen Victoria. 
Um, but he was respected in both the white and the indigenous worlds as a, as a great leader and proselytizer. He was fervently in support of the government and the policies they're about to promote here. On the, on the native side were the three principal chiefs. So John Sunday and Joseph Sawyer of the Massasauga, who again were on the government side agreeing that their proposals were what they wanted, wanted to follow. And then there was Chief Yellowhead, um, the principal chief of the Chippewa. And there's a picture of Aurelia at the time. It was a very small town. So right off the top, after a, a brief introduction, um, Superintendent Anderson presented five policy proposals that he wanted the uh, native chiefs to agree to. The first one, he wanted all the tribes to give up the reserves they were living on and to move together to live on one large reserve, what would be out in the Saugeen lands at the base of the Bruce Peninsula. So the, the Saugeen Chippewa had a reserve of 450,000 acres. So it was, it was going from like Wyerton over to uh, Lake Huron at, at, uh, at the Saugeen River. It was a huge reserve and he was proposing all the natives from all across Ontario move onto that one reserve and live together. So again, the Massasauga and the Chippewa, while they were all Ojibwe, they were separate nations um, or separate politically anyway. And on top of that, the, the two Mohawk reserves were traditional enemies of the Ojibwa. They had had a fierce war in the 1890s and there was still a lot of animosity there and they still treated themselves um, as separate nations diplomatically as well. And it even happened at this meeting in one. So to ask them all to move onto one big reserve together to give up the last remnants of their ancestral lands was a big ask. The second ask was the government wanted all the Indians to send their children to residential schools where they could learn the white ways, where they could um, pick up the value system of, of white society. Thinking that if the children could be indoctrinated in the white way of life, they could go back and they could teach future generations um, how to live as the whites do and become a part of society. This was um, argued as the, uh, the only way um, you are ever going to assimilate into white society and white society is here to say, so it's do or die with this. So there was a big push for that. The third, the third demand or proposal was that one quarter of their annuity money from every reserve would go to pay for these new schools. Well, that's a big ask because most of the native reserves were living in abject poverty. Um, this was the only income they had. Um, few of them had much success as farmers. They relied on their money to support them during the year. To give a quarter of their income away just to support these schools was questionable. But likewise, they moved on the reserves in the first place under the promise that the white government was going to provide schools on each reserve. And there was a small school on every reserve. Now, those were all going to disappear, and the Indians were going to be paying for their own schools. Um, that would be these, these residential schools. So again, this was asking very poor societies to give away a quarter of their annual income, which was a, was a big lift. Fourthly, the government was more than asking, they were insisting that the natives um, give up hunting and become sedentary farmers. Um, there were so many complaints to, to neighboring, from neighboring white settlers of, of the Indians intimidating them. They wanted them to get on the reserves and stay in the reserves and stop getting in the way. They, they really needed them to give up hunting. Um, and fifthly, the goal for the government was to teach the natives to be self-sufficient. Um, and this proposal said, we want you to stop hiring white men to come in and, and building your mills and building your, your dams and building your houses. We want you to learn how to do it for yourselves. We want you to be an independent, uh, community and the subtext was so we don't have to worry about you. So this is this was the proposal and they, right off the top of the meeting he he put these out there. Now he had spent a year um, traveling around each reserve diplomatically trying to uh, uh, assess support for this and he knew where he stood with most of the most of the chiefs. Um, but this was the formal presentation and uh, this was going to be the sales job. Now. 
there were some big implications, as I said, with these proposals um, for the for the native peoples. But the biggest one was that this meant there had to be a complete change in their value system. They had to give up hunting for farming, but mostly they had to give up the communal lifestyle. They had always worked as a group with their, their hunting and their gathering and their, the farming that they did do, and they shared equally the fruits of, of all their efforts. Now they were being um, encouraged to take up private ownership, to take up uh, an individual lifestyle, and to take up a, a, a kind of capitalism they didn't know before. They had uh, always done commerce in their fur trade and, and other trading networks, but this capitalism on a one-on-one -on -one family level was a complete change in, in uh, their value system. This, this, this was a dramatic ask that I don't think the, uh, the government agents really understood what, how traumatic this was gonna be for their society. But the, the second half of this, they were being asked to make this complete change in their value system, but they left structural roadblocks in place. At, at this point in 1846, um, there was no route for uh, the indigenous people to ever achieve citizenship. There was no legal basis for them to own land. To own land, you had to be a citizen. Um, to get citizenship for an, for um, for a new person coming to the country to get citizenship, you had to be a landowner. So it was a catch-22. You, you can't own land without being a citizen. You can't be a citizen without getting land. And they made no effort, and there was no proposal here to change either of those things. Um, this was a real roadblock for any kind of success in, in uh, the policy changes they were making. But the biggest structural roadblock beyond that, even if they did learn the white ways and they did have the leadership and they did take up the capitalism, there was still the question of prejudice between the white settlers and the natives that was very powerful. They were seen as inferior, unsophisticated people and uh, they would never be treated as equals. Um, and that, that was gonna be a big problem. So this was a big ask on those proposals and they left these roadblocks in place. There was also the unspoken agendas. The, each, each of the three groups involved, the, the government, the, the indigenous people, and the Methodist missionaries who had spent so much time and energy proselytizing to the, to the native communities, they each had their own agendas. Um, for the government, the, their biggest goal was to get the natives off their reserves and get them onto this, this big uh, consolidated reserve. Um, the government was constantly inundated with complaints about the natives and and interactions with them on their on their um, their farms to get them off their reserves and onto the one big reserve up in the Bruce Peninsula means that the government would assume all that land of the of the native reserves and they could sell them off at profit. Um, so getting them off the reserves was a, was the big key thing for the government. Consolidating them all on one big reserve was gonna save them a lot of money. Instead of having six Indian agents traveling to 20 different reserves, they could have two Indian agents catering to one big reserve. It was gonna be a lot more efficient for them and save money. And their eventual goal, and there was a lot of pressure for this, especially from the colonial government in England, was what do we need an Indian department for anyway? Why don't we teach them to be self-sufficient? We'll push them away to a corner of the province and they can take care of themselves. And at that point, we don't even need an Indian department. So the only reason the government wanted the schools was just so that they could become more self-sufficient and they could be ignored at that point and they could get rid of the Indian department and save a, a, a lot of money. So that was the unspoken agenda for the government. For the Methodist missionaries who would work so hard proselytizing, trying to convert the, the indigenous people to Methodism, um, they wanted to reduce the costs of their admin, of ministering. So instead of traveling to 20 reserves, you could just spend your time on one reserve. That was going to save money. The method of missionaries ran all the schools and they were the teachers in all the schools. So instead of 20 schools, you could have two schools. It'd be a whole lot cheaper for them to operate that. But mostly they wanted to protect their sway over the, the natives in their religion. They had spent a lot of time and energy converting them all to Methodism. And now the Anglicans, who were the dominant religion in Upper Canada, they were the state religion, 
were starting to reach out to the settlers in and around the natives and they were starting to um, uh, approach the uh, uh, the chiefs on the native reserves and they succeeded in getting Chief Yellowhead to switch over to Anglicanism. Um, so the Methodists were, I wanna, don't wanna say they were at war with the Anglicans, but there was a lot of animosity there and they wanted to protect the, the, the investment they had made in, in uh, uh, ministering to the natives. Those, you know, those two things are sort of banal bureaucratic goals, what they wanted to do. They wanted to save money and, and protect their interests. For the natives, it was very different. Their goal was to survive as a people. They, they could easily see um, being wiped out by disease or a war would, would decimate them. Um, they did not want confrontation. They were looking for a way to survive as a people. They felt the only way to do that was to learn the ways of the white man, but not so much as to, they weren't so much as looking to be assimilated into white society. They were looking to find a way to cohabit. They wanted to coexist with them as a sovereign nation and to be two nations working together diplomatically as opposed to being absorbed by them. But ultimately what they really wanted was to get out of abject poverty. They had, they had lived relatively well uh, long before the British came, but after the advent of the Europeans, um, their, their quality of life had, had disintegrated and they were living in real poverty now. And they thought, if they could learn to cohabit with the white ways and they could support each other, they could, they could have a better quality of life. The key point to all of this is there were benefits to all three. If, if their plan worked, all three could benefit. But if this didn't work, the government didn't lose much. The missionaries weren't going to lose much. All the risk landed on the natives. They were giving up the last of their ancestral land and that wasn't ever gonna come back if this didn't work out. If they got plunked onto a consolidated reserve, there was no going back. Likewise, sending your children away to be indoctrinated by, by the, the white man, there's no going back from that. You know, this, it's an experience you, you, you can't turn around and you're not raising your own children. And what a, what a shock to a society to give your children away. That's a, that's a, that's a huge risk. But the biggest thing is that the benefits, even if it worked beautifully and the, the children went away and became educated in white ways and came back to the reserves and became leaders and, and taught, their, taught their people how to, to assimilate into white society, the prejudice was still there. And it's not guaranteed that they would ever be accepted by white society no matter how hard they tried. So there were huge risks on, on the native side, very little risk on the white man's side. So, we get to day one, they, they got their, their um, presentation of the five points. And then each of the six men on the government side got up and made a speech. This took about three hours to go through all their speeches and they all hit on the same points. First of all, the natives living in poverty, they disingenuously said, it's all your fault that you live in poverty. You're not trying hard enough to take up the white ways. Um, if you if you would give up hunting and really dedicate yourself to farming, you could be just as successful as as uh, the white communities nearby. And this was a real affront to Yellowhead and Ashante. I mean, Ashante and his people were living on Bosley Island, which is a rock out in Georgian Bay. And there's there's no farming on Bosley Island. And to say that it's your fault that you're poor because you're not farming was very disingenuous. And they knew it. But this is the argument they all made. Um, they, they all, again, stress the fact that you're not working hard enough to learn the white ways. They also stress that the schools, they created this idyllic idea of the schools that you send your children away and you're gonna, this is a quote from, from the Indian agent that the schools are gonna produce Indian doctors and Indian lawyers and interpreters and politicians. They're gonna get this great education and it's gonna turn your society around. Um, they all harped on this fact that this was gonna be of such great benefit to the, to the native society. They all harped on the fact that your children are your future. You've gotta learn the white ways. It's the children who are gonna be your leaders of the future. You've gotta put your efforts into your children. And the last one is, it was a threat. And this came up six times that this was gonna be the last time you're ever gonna get an offer this good. Um, if you don't take this, we don't promise what's going to happen to you in future. And it was very threatening. And they said it in a very threatening manner. Um, but that was the presentation. 
After the, the government men spoke, each chief got up to state his position on the two main points of the consolidated reserve and the residential schools. Most of them um, spoke in favor of it, but Chiefs Yellowhead and Ashante uh, put their foot down and with great passion said, no, we will not do this. Their reasoning was that the white man was not to be trusted. There is great risk in these, in these proposals. We have accepted the white man's word in the past and it has not come to pass time after time after time. We've been disappointed too many times. We don't trust you that what you say is true. And for that reason, we're not going to do it. They were the only two chiefs to speak passionately like that. Then the government officials left. They, they ended the meeting. And this was set up by, the, by um, Anderson, the Indian agent. He knew that Yellowhead and Ashante were going to object. And he had, he had set this up that they would leave and he would leave all the chiefs alone to discuss the proposals among themselves. And it was clear this was designed for the chiefs to bring pressure to bear on Yellowhead and Ashante to, uh, um, to agree. Um, the recording secretary left, and so there's no record of what was said at this meeting, but it was clear that Ashante and Yellowhead were the targets. And this went on for several hours. It was all moderated by Peter Jones, that uh, Indian um, missionary who was clearly on the government side, and he guided the, the debate. But uh, from afar, you could see that it was Ashante and Yellowhead who were on the defensive through this whole debate. When, when night fell, they, they uh, closed the meeting, and in the morning, the government was going to come back and they were going to present um, their ideas. But when at 10.30 in the morning, when, when Anderson came back to start the meeting, he was stopped by a warrior and said the chiefs want to continue the debate. And the chiefs sat down uh, um, among themselves and went on for another hour and a half of browbeating the, the two recalcitrant trees, chiefs. Then Anderson called the meeting to order and he asked for each chief to stand up and state his position, uh, yes or no, whether they would move their their people to the one big reservation. Four enthusiastically agreed that they would they would move. Five thought it was a good idea, but for various reasons, um, they 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 couldn't say absolutely yes. They had to ask. One had to wait for a, their, a meeting with an agent from Montreal. Um, others had to talk to other people. Some of them wanted to talk to their, their people again before they would vote in favor. But in general, they said, yeah, it's a good idea, but we're not sure. And Yellowhead and Ashante were adamantly opposed and they said so, and they said why. Um, and it's because they were not to be trusted. Then they had the vote on residential schools. All of them were completely in agreement on this, except Yellowhead and Ashante, who put their foot down and said, we will not send our children to your school. And there was an interesting exchange here. Um, Anderson, the Indian agent, intervened at this point, and uh, he said, "Well, you say if if the governor general had requested it, you would consider residential schools." And he asked Yellowhead to comment on that. And comment, uh, Yellowhead looked him in the eye and said, "I will not send my children to schools run by you. If the governor general proposes it, I would consider it." And it was, uh, it, it was a very decisive insult directly at uh, Anderson, who was the one who had let Yellowhead down time and time again during the 1830s on their reserves. Then a provocative question arose, and this was set up in advance, I'm sure, but uh, Yellowhead's secondary chief, Nanagishkong, rose and asked the Indian agent a question. He said, if I took half of the Rama band and we moved to the Consolidated Reserve, could we take half of the annuity money with us, the yearly money they got paid for giving up their land? And Anderson fell over himself in agreement and said, yes, if half the people move, half the annuity money will move with them. And this was just encouraging the schism. It was stabbing a knife in Yellowhead's back. Um, trying to draw as many of his people away from him as he could. It was very provocative. And uh, it, an hour later, um, 
the, the Indian agent actually raised this again and came up with it in writing and said, here's a contract. If, if half the people move, half the money moves with you. And I've written it down here. Um, that was one of the things he was trying to, to uh, use to uh, sway Yellowhead. Um, then after the votes were taken, um, Assistant Superintendent Varden um, got up to respond to the chiefs. And uh, he put a, a heavy sales pitch on how important it was to get everyone onto one big reserve and all the advantages there would be a one big reserve. It was clear this was, this was the desperate thing the government wanted was to get the natives all onto one reserve and, and, and get them away from the white settlers. Um, but after he'd stated his case there and he'd, he'd, he'd uh, made more promises, he turned and viciously attacked Chiefs Yellowhead and Ashante. Uh, first, he blamed them for all the failures. He, he said, your land is just as good as our, our land uh, that we're on here in Aurelia, and yet you live in poverty and the white settlers in Aurelia are, are finding prosperity. Knowing full well that the, the northern parts of that reserve were swampland and Muskoka rock, um, even the southern part of, of the Rammer Reserve, it's, it's gravelly soil compared to what we have in Aurelia. It was very disingenuous, um, but he blamed them for the failure. He didn't, he didn't ad admit that there was any reason for it to be like that. Then he blamed them specifically for not working hard enough to take up the white ways and, and falling into drunkenness and all the vices that the white men show. And you're following all the wrong traits of the white men. And this was a jab at Ashante who still had a weakness for alcohol. And then even worse, um, he called them arrogant for placing themselves on an equal footing with the governor general. I would move my children to schools if the governor general asked me, but I won't move them to schools that Anderson is gonna propose. Yellowhead was, was under the, the attitude that we are a sovereign nation. And as a sovereign nation, I will talk to the leader of your sovereign nation, the, the, the Queen's representative, the governor general. It was totally rational for him to do that. But Varden attacked him, calling him arrogant. You're the only one here who sees yourself as a, on the equal with the governor general. It, it was a pretty vicious thing to say. But then after doing this, he pulled out an agreement they had written up and all the chiefs came up and uh, signed signed on to accept the five proposals, except for Yellowhood and Ashante. And that's what that says, so. Um, but then there was a change. The next morning, um, Yellowhead was called to a meeting with, with Anderson and Varden. Uh, what was said there was unrecorded, but there obviously and clearly was some serious arm twisting and threats. Uh, because at the end of the meeting, Yellowhead signed a paper that said uh, he had voted under a misapprehension and he now agrees to the five points. I mean, it was a total capitulation. Um, the only thing that they could have done was saying that they were going to withhold all support and all annuity money um, forever if you don't sign on to this. I mean, that's the only thing that would have gotten him to do this. There's some, something of, of that nature that was a real threat. In the afternoon, they travel out to Coldwater. They have the same meeting with Ashante, and he signs the same paper. So then Anderson was able to go back to the lieutenant governor and say, I have unanimous support um, for the five proposals. So what were the outcomes? What happened? He had, he had the, all the natives signing on the proposals. What happened? Well, the one big reservation never happened. The, all, the, all the tribes are still on the same reservations today that they were on in 1846. Um, the only minor changes. Uh, I think what happened is the chiefs went back and told their people that we are giving up our land and we're moving out to the, the big reserve. And I think the people didn't want to go. I don't think they had the support they thought they had, but the big reserve never happened for whatever reason. But two residential schools were built. The first residential schools in Canada, they were negotiated in Aurelia and they were built. Um, we'll get into that in a second. Both Yellowhead and Ashanti's bands after 1846 went into serious decline for two main reasons. One, the Methodists abandoned them after, um, um, after the Anglicans got a foothold and built a, a small church in Rama. But even the Anglicans treated them as second class citizens. They were only out there, you know, briefly once each week and there was just no support. So the main support 
um, for the uh, Native Society, the ministers disappeared and the government support vanished after that point. They became pariahs and uh, no extra effort was put into solving problems for them and any, any financial support disappeared. So they went into real decline. Chief Ashanti died less than a year later. He fell out of a canoe and drowned in a drunken stupor. Um, it was a sad ending for him. Chief Yellowhead um, lived for another 15 years, or I guess almost 20 years. Um, but after this meeting, he was pretty much marginalized within his band. He was a chief in name only. The uh, Nana Gishkong and Big Schilling um, and Big Win, the secondary chiefs, assumed uh, leadership within the band. And, and this was very clear that when Yellow had died in 1864, he named his nephew as his successor, as he had no children himself. But the band bypassed the chosen successor um, and named Nana Gishkong's son the new hereditary leader of the Rama band. So the residential schools, there were two schools built, one in Alderville, which is outside Peterborough. It was called the Alnwick School in 1848, and one in the, on the Muncie Town Reserve, which is outside London, um, called the Mount Elgin Industrial Institute. These were schools, this is the, the picture here is Mount Elgin. This is what they built. Um, they were big substantial buildings with dormitories and cafeterias and, and uh, school rooms, but most importantly, each reserve donated 200, land, 200 acres of land for a farm and they become farm schools. The, uh, the children um, did take classes, but they spent more hours working at manual labor each day than they did in the classroom. Um, it was strict indoctrination into the white ways. They had to take up white names. They had to give up their moccasins and leather uh, or buckskin for breeches and shoes. Um, they were punished severely for uh, following traditional um, societal ways. They were, they, they were forced to behave as young white people. Um, and needless to say, there was a lot of uh, discord about that. But what, they, what quickly came up, the Indians realized after only a few months, was that this was not a school that was going to produce doctors and lawyers and interpreters and clerks. This was a school that was designed to turn, farm, turn out farmers. All their classes were, uh, were centered around farm work. For the, for the girls, all, it was all about uh, pioneer farm work and you know, knitting and, and making yarn and churning butter. That's what they were learning. They were not learning mathematics or, or philosophy or anything like that. This, this was an industrial school to turn out farmers. And the, the chiefs were disillusioned very quickly about this. Um, The children uh, soon began running away. The, the initial students who were sent there were all teenagers, um, and they were old enough to know I'm not I'm not buying into this. And they would try to run back to their parents. Um, every year it'd be a younger and younger cohort of children who would be moved in there until they were six and seven and eight year olds were starting to go to school, and they were too young to run away. And there was a lot of abuse of every form going on there. And what they found, what the chiefs found is that the children who did graduate and returned to their reserves had no interest in becoming the leaders and teaching the white ways and they quite quickly returned to native traditions. So it was a total failure in that regard. By 1856, remember this is only about seven years after the, the Almec school opened, the consensus was that the schools were a favor, were a failure. I mean, the, for, the, for the, the government, they found they weren't learning the white ways very well. They weren't learning to be self-sufficient very well. They weren't taking to farming very well. Um, for, the, for the Methodists who were running these schools, they weren't making a whole lot of headway in converting them all to Methodism. They were, it was more like they were pushing them back into native culture in, in rebellion. Um, for the, for the, the chiefs, they weren't getting any leaders who were going to help them assimilate into society or even uh, coexist with the whites any better than they were now. And for the children, it was an abject disaster, obviously. So uh, Alnook was closed in 1856 after seven years. Mount closed in 1862. Um, and uh, everyone involved, even Egerson Ryerson, who was the great 
um, leader in education in the, in the government of Upper Canada agreed that it was an abject failure. Um, but they came back in 1867 with Confederation and John A. Macdonald taking control of the Indian Department. He bought Rupert's land, which is all the Hudson's Bay land out into the prairies. And he started negotiating with the, the Cree and the Assiniboine and the native tribes out there to purchase their lands uh, and, and create land treaties. And the natives all asked for schools to teach them the white ways. And they started opening these schools all across Canada. They were eventually were 130 residential schools, as many as 80 at one time. And those are the schools we're, we're seeing the repercussions of today. So these two that came out of the meeting in Aurelia were like the pilot project but the disaster was what came afterwards. So in an epilogue, this is a summary. Yellowhead and Ashanti had the insight, the insight that you can't trust the whites, that what they say is not what's going to happen, but they were ignored. The residential schools, the idea that if you educate your children and your children become the leaders of your society is a reason, reasonable concept, but it was a disaster in execution. And in my book, I explained why that all came to be, but I won't get into that now. Um, then the third thing, and I think this is really important, is they were, the, the Indigenous peoples were told there is only one route to assimilation. You must learn the white ways, and you can only learn the white ways by sending your children to residential schools. Well, there were options, and no one presented these options. They could have uh, made some laws and, and, and found a policy that was a route to citizenship and citizenship was empowerment. Um, and that could have made a, a, a world of difference in uh, the assimilation of the natives into white society. Likewise, land ownership, they could have easily changed the laws to allow the natives to own land instead of having it held in trust. Um, they could have owned their own plot of farmland. And again, it's empowerment and, and it's control of your own future. Um, where they could have made something of themselves. But if you don't own the land, but you're still forced to farm as a single family, um, there's just there's no route to success that way. Um, and what I think probably should have happened instead of creating these residential schools, they could have enhanced the schools that were already present on each reserve, have the native chiefs a part of the policy making of the curriculum and what they were teaching. And they could have they could have developed schools that could have been successful. They could have taught the white ways, but they also could have taught them the skills to be leaders um, and not these uh, industrial schools that they did come up with. And finally, my final point is we learn our history in school I and mean, we learn about Wolf and Montcalm and the Plains of Abraham and the War of 1812 and all these things. We don't learn much about indigenous history but even the indigenous history we learn, we never hear the words Yellowhead or Ashanti mentioned. And they were the men of great insight and they are completely forgotten footnotes, footnotes in history. So it's, it's kind of sad, but that's the story. And that story repeated itself all across Canada time after time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end there. It was a long talk. I'm sorry to go so long. Um, I am happy to answer questions. You can, you can type answers into the chat and Monica or uh, uh, Lindsay will answer your questions, but uh, um, if you want to learn more about this, I've written my little book um, on Yellow Hoods of Revolt. Let me see if I can bring this up here. I have to, I forget what I do here now. <laughs> okay, forget that. Um, um, my, I, my book on Yellow Hoods Revolt, I, everything I talked about, I go into far greater detail um, and uh, you can learn more about it there and, and the, uh, the repercussions of this. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay. And uh, if you, have, you, can, you can ask her questions or you can type into the chat and uh, we'll just wait and see if you guys come up with anything. So thank you very much. Dave, thank you so much. Um, fascinating, fascinating talk. And the book as well uh, is very, very much worth the read uh, for everyone listening tonight. Um, I had one question come in early on in the talk um, where someone asks about, uh, did the Indigenous people understand the idea of selling land in that they did not generally believe that they owned the land? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a really important point because that's exactly true. The whole idea of ownership was foreign to them because they lived in a communal lifestyle. They they had their territory and they would um, live in their hunter-gatherer form within their territory, but 
everything was communal. They, they lived in longhouses where there would be six families living in one building together and they shared their space. Um, the idea of land ownership was foreign to them. And that's why that was the whole basis of the, the land claim um, that Yellowhead brought when they moved to Rama was that they didn't understand the repercussions of what they were signing on to. And uh, they were really taken to the bank by the, by the Lieutenant Governor over that one. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complete value change. Um, this, this idea of individual ownership is, was just so foreign to them. And, uh, and that's part of the problem all across Canada. Yeah, and that's uh, from Vicky and Bill. So thank you to you guys. Um, and like Dave said, if there are any questions, uh, drop them in the Q&A uh, so that we can answer them. Um, we have one coming in here. Um, and it says, uh, this is from Bill. And it says, what's happening with the Champlain Monument? Uh, <laughs> here in the park was a plaque saying the Rama Band had, uh, in quotes, ceded Aurelia's land. Uh, including their original village uh, to the whites, has that plaque changed? I, I don't know if the plaque has changed, but boy, that's a contentious issue. Yes. Uh, everyone has their own opinion on it. I've heard people speaking adamantly on both sides of that debate. Um, um, I, I personally think that uh, the design of, of, the, of the statue was a little bit derogatory. And I can understand the, the natives complaints about that. And I can even understand the complaints of bringing back the proposal was to bring back just Champlain and the two sidebars come off. Um, but as, as the, the indigenous people are saying right now, the, the celebrating the Europeans arrival in North America is an insult to us. We don't even want Champlain back. And I can see that too. So it's, it's difficult and I can't say more than that about it. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to say more than that about it. <laughs> um, Janet is asking you to just clarify. Um, she says it's her understanding that Chief Yellowhead gave the land on which St. James Anglican Church, as well as the land for the rectory in Aurelia. Um, is this correct? He gave that land to the church? Gave it to the church. It wasn't his to give. Um, they ceded that land to the government of Upper Canada when they moved out to Rama. And there's a whole story around how that happened, but they gave up the land. Yellowhead, they had built Yellowhead a big frame house um, for the chief's use. And he had to give that house up um, himself. So that was a personal loss to him. But uh, um, he, it wasn't his land to give up. The, the land was given, given to the government and the government sold it parcel by parcel um, two white settlers who came in and uh, developed the, the, the town site that's there now. Now, the, the site of the Angling Church is, was a very contentious point. That was the site of the schoolhouse that doubled as the meeting house for the churches. Um, and uh, it, when, when the, the Chippewa moved out to Rama, that was taken over by the Anglican Church. Whether they bought it or not, I think it was probably just given to them, the schoolhouse, that site and and they have uh, uh, they've owned it ever since. And it's interesting to note that uh, Yellowhead uh, took up the Anglican, Anglican religion in 1844. His band wouldn't follow him, but he stayed in Anglican the rest of his life. And uh, he was buried on the front lawn of the Anglican Church. And there's a little there's a little book written by Harold Hale who said that it was 15 feet south of Coldwater Road and 30 feet east of Peter Street was the site of his grave. I don't think what's well, not there anymore. The tombstones been his gravestones have moved three times. So uh, um, but that's where he was laid to rest where his bones are now. No one knows. But uh, um, but the land wasn't his to give and the land was ceded. Um, Dave, we have a couple people uh, just double checking the title of your book. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, actually, I can probably see it here now. So it's can you see that Yellowheads Revolt. Same as the story here. Um, there's a second one. The first one I wrote is called Aurelia Civil War, which is the whole story of, of the, the settlement of Aurelia and the removal of the natives to Rama. And then Yellowhead's Revolt is the story of the meeting, which is what I told tonight. And there's way more detail on the book than I could present in one hour. You know, I, could, I could have spent five hours giving this talk. There's all, there's all kinds of details and fascinating sidebar stories in there, but uh, you got the gist of it tonight. 
-hmm. So Yellowhead's Revolt was this one, and Aurelia's Civil War was the, the settlement of Aurelia. Um, we have a question from Diane who asks, did you discover anything about treaties on the Severn prior to the big meeting? <laughs> that was the first bit of land that uh, the, the Chippewa in this area gave up. So in 1789, um, after the American Revolution, the British were very afraid that the new United States were going to try to take the British colonies of Canada. Um, and so they set about um, uh, military preparations for that. And the best transportation was water routes. And so they tried to secure land where they could have water routes. Well, the best water route from York, where Toronto is, up to Penetang, where they had their, their uh, naval establishment, the best route was uh, up the water and uh, through Simcoe and Coochting and then down the Severn River. So in 1789, they approached uh, Yellowhead's father, Chief Yellowhead Sr., and secured the cessation of that land of the Severn River and one mile on each side of the Severn River um, um, for a cash payment. And that became um, a transportation route for the, for the uh, emergency, in, in case of emergency during uh, military operations. So that was, that was when uh, the Severn River disappeared. That was the first land they gave up. The, the next one came in 1815, no, no, 1898. They, they ceded uh, uh, the land on the peninsula around Penetang because they had the, the naval establishment of Penetang. Um, and so the government wanted to secure ownership of that land. So then they bought that land from them. And then 1815 was the next one. Okay, um, I'm going to just cap it off here with one last question. Um, we do have a couple of others coming in that I can just answer briefly, um, including folks wondering where they can buy Dave's books uh, through OMA, of course. Uh, our gift shop does uh, stock, um, I think, almost all of Dave's books, unless we've sold out. Um, Dave, are there any other sources where folks can look for your books? Yeah, so the, um, the gift shop at Oma and Manticore Books has has a supply, and then I have a supply myself. I have my, I have them at my offices in Aurelia and Coldwater, my chiropractic offices. You can pick them up there, or you can just contact me directly, and I can arrange to get them to you as well. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up with just one last question here. Unfortunately, we do have to move on, but thank you to everyone who's uh, submitting questions. Um, we have one last one here from Jeffrey. So uh, he says, if I remember correctly what you said, the government and the missionaries knew before the 1846 meeting that Yellowhead and Ashanti were likely to be against the government proposals. Mm -hmm. Why then did the government hold the great meeting in Aurelia? I wonder why they didn't hold it in York or somewhere else further south, closer to the area where the government hoped to locate the one big reservation. I think it was it was part of his his um, his diplomatic plan. He was trying to soften him up, um, you know, paying him respect. We'll, we'll come to you and have the meeting. I, I think was the approach. Um, we'll make it as easy as we can for you. We'll show you respect, and uh, um, we'll we'll hope that that'll help sway you. He did a lot of things to help to sway him. It, 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 one of the things he said at the meeting. You know, at, right at the very end, after the vote had gone on, um, he said, uh, at, throwing the chief specifically a bone, he said that if you have personal property on the reserves, will and you move to the consolidated reserve, we will allow you to sell that property at your own personal profit. Um, because if you give up the reserves lands that you're giving up, that we're just going to take those and sell them to our own personal profit. But if you happen to own a house or a farm or you have some land that you have acquired on your own, we'll allow you to sell that yourself. And only the chiefs had the wherewithal to own things like that. Yellowhead, personally, um, he owned, uh, uh, um, I think it was a 200 acre farm on the reserve that uh, he would have been able to sell for himself. So they were doing a lot of things to try to uh, um, convince him, you know, to, to they were trying to show him respect. So I think that's probably why the meeting was there. I can't think of any other good reason anyway. Okay, thank you so much. So um, unfortunately we are out of time for questions. Um, 
to wrap it up, I'm going to pass it over to Trish, uh, again, the head of the history committee at ELMA. Great. Thanks a lot, Leslie. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of OMA and the History Committee, I want to thank, first of all, Dave for his ongoing support of the History Speaker Series and joining us again tonight to recount uh, the story of this very important event in our local history. I know by the, the questions and the enthusiasm by everybody, everybody's learning a lot of this history and it's a very relevant topic. So thank you so much for uh, coming tonight, Dave. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you. And also a big thanks to all of you in attendance. Uh, wonderful turnout. We thank you so much for your ongoing support of the speaker series. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Now, as we have in the past, we are going to send out a survey with a link also to the YouTube version of this presentation if you want to revisit it. And we really would appreciate if you could get back to us and give us your input on the speaker ser series. And so what we're gonna do is kind of different for this year is uh, for those who respond to our surveys, uh, your names are gonna be included in our quarterly draws for some OMA swag. So we hope you'll respond because we really do listen to what you say. So for example, in the 2021 surveys, um, we had some people respond, majority of people saying that they really appreciated the Zoom option um, this past year for presentations. But we also heard from people who say, when it's safe to do so, we would really like a hybrid option so we could kind of make the choice to come in person or stay at home. And so just to let you know, we have listened. It's been shared back with Oma, who is very actively looking into live stream options. So hopefully near the end of this year, when it's safe to do so, we'll have a hybrid option for you. So do please fill out those surveys. They're very important to us. Um, so 2022, we have a full lineup for you. So I'll just give you a flavor of what's coming your way. Uh, next month is Black History Month, and on February 16th, we learn new insights into the black, black experience of the War of 1812 and the history of some of the veterans who are from the Oro Township. So our guest speaker is Fred Blair, um, through his extensive research on the War of 1812 militia regiments, is one of the most knowledgeable of the role of Black um, veterans who played a role in that war. He's also a member of our history committee and a recent winner of the Aura. Uh, Heritage Award for bringing to life our local history through his many publications. So we hope you can join us in February. And in March, we have uh, John Salvage. We welcome him back as our guest speaker. He's a descendant of Etwan Gadar, who's a fur trader and Aurelius first non-Indigenous settler. He spoke in July 2021 about the fur trade, but this time he's going to talk about the War of the Woods. That's going to recount the history of lumbering in our area its economic dominance, the devastating impact lumbering had on our local environment, as well as our Indigenous people, and how it still shapes today many aspects of our lives. So lots coming our way, so we hope you can join us, and thank you again for joining us tonight. Take care.